Good afternoon. Uh, so the last YPF of the year, but it's part of the cycle which will go on till uh, August next year. So as the immediate past president, I would like to welcome you for the uh, Young Physician Forum presentation for the 12, December 2023. Uh, so today's we have two Young Vision Forums uh, supported by CIPLA and followed by the college lecture uh, supported by the HEMAS Sidus. So to start with today's Young Vision Forum, I would like to invite Dr. APD Manodhya, Senior Lecturer, Senior Registrar in Respiratory Medicine, National Hospital for Respiratory Disease, Valisara. She'll be talking to us lung window in systemic vasculitis. Uh, or to Manodhya and also now even that uh, lectures has to be for 25 minutes only and uh, so please finish it on time. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Dilhara Manodhya, Senior Registrar in Respiratory Medicine uh, from National Hospital of Respiratory Diseases, Valisara. And uh, uh, today's topic uh, of my talk is lung window in systemic vasculitis. So to begin with, uh, I'd like to give a brief introduction about systemic vasculitis. It's usually a presentation of systemic disorder characterized by inflammation of different size vessels. So the pathology can be due to a variety of immunological mechanisms, and it could be primary or secondary as well. And most importantly, the diagnosis of disorders is, is exceptionally challenging because of their highly variable clinical presentation and relative rarity of the disease, and also overlap of signs and symptoms of more common disease entities. So um, I'd like to begin uh, this presentation with a brief case history that we have encountered in the recent past. Uh, this is a 58-year-old male who's diagnosed patient with diabetes and hypertension. And he has presented to us with history of hope, shortness of breath, loss of appetite, and loss of weight for about three months duration. And at presentation, he did not have a fever, but there was one episode of hemoptysis prior to admission, but no other treating manifestations, and it also uh, settled spontaneously. And there were no past history of contact history of TB. Uh, and his other system involvement, uh, there were no other uh, system involvement, no other uh, CTD features. In his exposure history, he was a farmer, he has exposure to paddy dust, but no other organic or inorganic exposures or any toxic use. Uh, before presentation to us, he was previously managed in a local hospital for uh, pneumonia with high inflammatory markers and he was treated with IV antibiotics. Uh, so, for the admission to our unit, he was uh, afebrile. There was some evidence of TNA infection in his lower limbs. Uh, in his vitals, there was a bit of tachycardia. Uh, 108 was the pass rate, and BP was 112 by 78 with respiratory rate of 70. And on the early saturation was around 91 to 93, and examination of the lungs, there were some bilateral, not bilateral actually, bilateral complications. And the six minute, uh, six minute walk test showed about 5% pre saturation. So, uh, having this history and clinical examination, we had some uh, possible differentials at this point. So, number one would be infective causes, that would be bacterial, fungal, pollen, you know, TB. And the other one would be the history of uh, exposure to heavy dust and the age at all, with the desaturation with exertion, interstitial uh, lung disease with all those possibility. And also the malignancy. And uh, the other one was vasculitis because the given history of uh, hemoptysis, there was one episode of hemoptysis, so it was also in the back of our minds. Uh, so, with this information, we went uh, ahead and did some investigations. His full blood count showed the WBC was not that high, highest was around 12, with neurotrophic dominance, with no uh, insomnophilia. There was some uh, hemoglobin was. Loss was around 10, which is not normal, normal fitting, and normal weight left counts. His infantry markers were initially high, if that was 97, and CRP was 93. Uh, renal and liver functions were okay, and in his unit part, it showed the uh, uh, process around 2 to 4, but there were no uh, red cells, there was no dysmorphic cells. 
and that is conscious, the uh, black party is conscious, and I have to also put it here, the spirit of party is also negative. And TV screening was conducted. It is negative all the spiritual entities, students first and Martin, and the culture is still empty. And uh, this article that we're going to do for those who are normal, as well as the individuals and the audience. So, um, with those investigations, these are his chest x rays, and these are the uh, three x rays we have taken during the course of his uh, hospital stay. And it shows there are some bilateral patchy opacities here in the right side. But there are some bilateral fatty opacities. So uh, with those, uh, mine we did the exercises with as well. Just we had some uh, question of that we uh, but there were no significant positive findings in that. Uh, I'd like to hold uh, my case history there, and I'll come back to it later. Uh, then I'd like to uh, start uh, my. Uh, main topic, the systemic vasculitis, the long window. Uh, before going into that, systemic vasculitis has a uh, very long history with regards to classification and nomenclature. So it starts way back in 1980s when polyarthritis nodus was nodus was first described as a uh, separate disease entity. And since then, up to 2022, there were several uh, disease classifications uh, endos, and their hallmarks were. Um, in 1990, it was the first American College of uh, uh, Comatologists, uh, then the first set of classification criteria were introduced. And after that, uh, 1994, uh, the first uh, Chamberlain Hill Consensus Conference, uh, they provided the nomenclature of uh, systemic vasculitis, followed by a revised uh, nomenclature in 2012. And the latest is 2022, it is the ACR EULA classification criteria. So. Uh, this is the classification and nomenclature evolution uh, uh, of systemic vasculitis. Uh, this shows uh, the Chamber Hill Consensus Conference, the 2012 uh, uh, classification criteria. It has uh, classified systemic vasculitis into various categories. The most common, the most known ones include the reported the size of vessels affected, the large vessels, medium vessels, and small vessels, and also some other categories, including. Very very well vessel vasculitis, uh, single organ vasculitis, and vasculitis associated with systemic disease, and vasculitis associated with probable etiology. So we all know that large vessel vasculitis mainly includes two: the tracheal arthritis and polyarthritis, uh, giant cell arthritis, and uh, the medium vessel vasculitis. It is uh, polyarthritis nodus and Kawasaki disease. But when it comes to lungs, the most important category would be small vessel vasculitis. Again, uh, classified into two and associated and in complex uh, associated small vessel vasculitis. So, uh, again, in a simple version, according to the vessel affected and the pathophysiologic mechanism of the disorder, uh, according to that, also we can classify like pose immune or even complex related disease. Uh, so, these are the uh, categories. And if I'd like to go, if, before going into the lung window in systemic vasculitis, I'd like to briefly uh, give some summary like uh, in large vessel and medium vessel vasculitis as well. So, uh, giant cell arthritis, uh, before going into the descriptions, I would like to say most of these uh, disease entities share uh, similar characteristics clinically, investigation wise, and also radiologically. But having said that, uh, it also has some pathognomonic, some specific features which will help you to uh, identify or get clues as well. So, uh, if I were to describe giant cell arthritis, the common symptoms would be systemic symptoms, and other ones would be the jaw claudications, visual symptoms, and uh, symptoms of uh, polymyalgia rheumatica. And examination wise, they can have abnormal pulses, temporal artery abnormalities, the bruise, and heart murmur. Uh, laboratory investigation would show uh, anemia or phenomenal density, uh, and they can have uh, thrombocytosis as well with high inflammatory markers. In the diagnosis wise, uh, the imaging and biopsy is helpful. Uh, in giant cell arthritis, the temporal arterial biopsy and ultrasound with Doppler, those two are the main uh, investigations uh, when it comes to diagnosis of giant cell arthritis in the imaging lab. 
and in Takya arthritis, again, the symptoms, percentage of symptoms are actually kind of universal in all categories. Apart from that, they can have arthralgias, carotidinia, uh, lymph prolication, angina, and respiratory symptoms. So, in examination wise, in those patients, again, the absent or weak peripheral pulses can be there, and of course, the arterial pulse. And importantly, the display of blood pressures and hypertension are striking features. So, uh, investigations, laboratory investigations are actually non specific and they can have high impact markers as other disease entities. And imaging and biopsy, uh, the MR angiography and CT angiography are helpful and also head scans. So, those are the uh, large vessel vascularitis entities. And if I were to describe uh, medium vessel vascularitis, in polyarthritis nodules, are the symptoms would include systemic symptoms. Apart from that, they can have skin lesions, uh, abdominal pain, polyneuritis, multipensal, myalgia, and muscle weakness. And examination, they can have systemic uh, skin manifestations, water weakness, or sensitivity to losses, along with hypertension. And uh, laboratory investigations are actually, there's no uh, uh, diagnostic test. Basic investigations we have to do to a certain the extent of the other organs affected and additional investigations to exclude other differential diagnosis. So in imaging and biopsy, the clinically affected organ, you can do the biopsy, and also arteriography and cross-section of imaging are helpful. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next slide, that is Kawasaki disease, the other disease entity in medium vessel vasculitis. Uh, it is again, the symptoms would be, they can have a fever, conjunctivitis, leukocytes, rashes, and arthralgia. And examination-wise, they can again have rashes. And importantly, they can have lymphadenopathy and other serious findings as well. So investigations, they would show high inflammatory markers, chromic non-cytic anemia, and depending on the severity of the disease, they can have evidence of uh, macrophage activity syndrome as well. So there are some diagnostic criteria to Kawasaki disease diagnosis. I will not go into that details. And I would like to say hypocardiography is also effective. So those are the large vessel vasculitis and medium vessel vasculitis. And when it comes to uh, lungs, in the role of lungs in the systemic disease, uh, systemic vasculitis, uh, in, uh, it is the small vessel vasculitis that is predominantly affecting the lungs. So that would be uh, uh, in uh, small vessel vasculitis also, uh, and vascular, associated vasculitis are the most common disease entities that will affect the lungs. So from all, now on, I will uh, describe uh, on and the associated vasculitis. So mainly there are three, granulomatosis with polyangitis, uh, what we call vaginistic granulomatosis, and then the microscopic polyangitis, and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, uh, which we call called Chirk-Strauss syndrome. Uh, so when a patient comes, uh, like the case discussed earlier, uh, in what are the clues in uh, history examination or the presentation that we can suspect that uh, this patient is, will could be having vasculitis, that we are dealing with a case of vasculitis. So the clinical scenarios that may prompt the condition, consideration of small vessel vasculitis, uh, they include uh, angular hemorrhages. Uh, that would be uh, diffuse like I have said, or not diffuse and tracheal subglottic stenosis, and pulmonary nodules or cavities, especially once the malignancy and, and uh, infection have been excluded, the pulmonary nodules and cavities are very common in patients with pulmonary vasculitis, and other thing is uh, glomerular nephritis, disruptive or alternative upper amenities is again a common presentation, and mononeuritis multiplex and retro orbital masses, such as pseudotumors in vaginas, they can have, and uh, palpable perfect. And other uh, disease entity would be, I mean, the presentation would be consideration of Church stroke syndrome can also be uh, crowned by the development of severe and refractory maturity onset of asthma with or without peripheral eosinophilia. So, those are the main uh, um, clinical scenarios that we can, we have to suspect if patient comes uh, with about those uh, symptoms. Uh, here I have summarized uh, clinical features of main three ankylosis and vasculitis actually. So upper air involvement, including 
uh, epistaxis, ulcerative and destructive lesions, otitis, sinusitis, and mastoiditis. So about 85% of patients with vagina, they can have upper uh, involvement, as well as in chest to uh, about 7 to 90% of patients commonly come as rhinitis and sinusitis. And uh, if you consider asthma in the areas, uh, in retinas as well as chest to trigonal, uh, those both disease entities, it is a common manifestation and common association, but in microscopic polyangitis, it's not very characteristic. And if you consider alveolar hemorrhages, uh, in vaginas as well as microscopic polyangitis, it is there, it can be there, but chest row syndrome, it is very rare to have alveolar hemorrhages. And the nodules, cavities, and infiltrates in the lungs, again, the Vaginas as well as Chuck's Ross syndrome, uh, both disease, both uh, disease entities, they can have uh, nodules, cavities, and infiltrates. Uh, in microscopic polyangitis, it is they can also have, but in a, in a less percentage than other two disease entities. And extra pulmonary disease, the constitution of symptoms, the glomerular lymphatics, muscular skeletal syndrome, cardiac occlusion. Those symptoms are also there in all three disease entities. So, this was a just a uh, brief summary of uh, manifestations of uh, uh, three small vessel vasculitis. So, uh, when a patient comes with uh, above symptoms in a manifestation that we could suspect this could be vasculitis, how we approach uh, how to diagnose these patients. So. Generally, we have to consider vasculitis to present with systemic or constitutional symptom in combination with evidence of single or multi organ dysfunction. So, it is generally based on the pattern of organ injury, the size of the vessels affected, histopathological features, and characteristic findings on uh, imaging. So, history, examination, and laboratory investigations are must. So if I would describe uh, the main, three main uh, anthrax-associated vasculitis, I would like to say uh, the granulomatosis polyangitis or vaginas, as well as microscopic polyangitis, they more or less share their diagnostic criteria. Uh, but uh, having said that, there were no universally accepted diagnostic criteria. So, uh, and there are the positive and strongly support that does not uh, confirm the diagnosis. And the histological examination of the affected tissue then is the most definitive method. So, having said that, the, those two disease entities, vaginas and polyangitis and microscopic, uh, polyangitis and microscopic, uh, microscopic polyangitis. Uh, in the biopsy, we can uh, differentiate those two. In vaginas, uh, there's evidence of necrotizing granulomatous inflammation affecting small to medium sized vessels. In microscopic polyangitis, the necrotizing vasculitis primarily affecting small to medium sized vessels can be seen, but typically the granulomatosis, granulomatous inflammation is absent there. So, in eosinophilic granulomatosis polyangitis, uh, or what we call Church Ross syndrome, uh, there's some classification criteria actually in, in uh, 2022 American College of Pharmacology as well as uh, EULA classification criteria. Actually, I have to say these are classification criteria. They are not diagnostic criteria, but we can have uh, get a close uh, to diagnose patients as well. So they have clinical criteria as well as laboratory and biopsy criteria. So clinical criteria would be obstructive airway disease, nasal polyps, and monocytosis multiplex. So those two, uh, those three uh, were given marks. And in laboratory and biopsy criteria, the blood is going to be found uh, more than one ten into nine power per liter. And extravascular is not really predominant information on biopsy. This is what the main finding. And the positive uh, test for CNK uh, antibodies and hematuria, they were given negative marks. So according to that, if the sum of the scores uh, is seven, and if the score is six or more, uh, we can have uh, idea that this could be is not really carrying on with So, uh, so next step we have uh, discussed a bit of the clinical presentation and we have discussed uh, a bit of uh, investigation findings in terms of laboratory investigation and then our diagnostic trial uh, 
diagnostic step would be uh, imaging. So in imaging also, uh, as I described earlier, the critical features, examination findings, laboratory data, laboratory investigation findings, all are, uh, there are no pathognomic uh, findings in those that we can diagnose vasculitis. It is same in the diagnosis in the imaging as well because in the uh, imaging findings are also there are no pathognomic findings, but we can have very important clues that this could be vasculitis. So uh, in imaging, the chest X-rays would be the initial one, but the thing is, it is often non-specific. Uh, it doesn't show the right pattern and extent of the toxic involvement. So in that case, the chart CT, high resolution CT, is the effective, most effective method. Uh, we can evaluate the characteristic, we can evaluate the distribution and also the evolution of the lung disease. So um, in HRCDs, uh, the radiological manifestations are actually, again, very vivid. They can have uh, so many findings, including small vessel wall thickening. They can be nodular lesions. They can be... The radiological features would be small vessel wall thickening, nodular lesions. I was just describing the HRCT findings that uh, we can get some clues whether this is a case of vasculitis. So that uh, the HRCT findings could be uh, so many, including small vessel wall thickening, nodular lesions, habitated lesions, and micronodules, ground, gas, ground glass opacities, uh, crazy paving pattern, the tracheal bronchial stenosis. There are many. Uh, but there are some uh, more common findings in HRCDs in about those mentioned small vessel vasculitis that we can get clues. So if I were to describe uh, granulometrosis with polyangitis or the vaginus, the most common HRCD abnormality would be lung nodules. And they usually, they are multiple and they are bilateral and they tend to increase with the disease progression. So it can range from few millimeters and up to, up to about 10 centimeters and they can become palatated. So these cavities usually having thick walls and they are characterized by irregular inner margins and absent calcification. So uh, when you see uh, a patient or see CD like that, so the first one and only differentiate or the diagnosis is not vasculitis. So this thick wall cavitated lesion can be seen in other disease conditions, other more common disease conditions such as malignancy and TPS or even fungal infection. So what I want to say is these are uh, most common finding in vaginus, but this is not uh, specific to vaginus granulomatosis. So, and the presence of uh, ground glass uh, opacities is also a finding, and it expresses as alveolar hemorrhage, and also the presence of an air bronchogram within the bowel of the body is equally typical of granulomatosis with polyangiitis, so uh, in uh, vaginus granulomatosis. So after therapy, these cavitated lesions, lesions usually show the resolution and uh, characterized by wall thinning. Uh, so if I were to describe chest stress disease, the radical, radiological findings, uh, the most frequently observed ones would be transient and often migrant opacities. So they can be bilateral, there's no segmental distribution, mostly peripheral. And again, these findings can be seen in other similar conditions like eosinophilic pneumonia, organizing pneumonia. In those conditions also, these findings could be there. They have to keep in mind. Uh, another most common abnormality in the HSPD is about 90% of patients, they can have uh, bilateral ground Again, non skinning and uh, some small peripronchial and central lobular nodules related to isometric infiltration of the bronchial wall as well. So, those are the main findings which we can see in patients with a chest stroke syndrome in HRCT. So, if I were to describe uh, microscopic polyangitis, so radiological lung features consist of uh, diffuse bilateral airspace, airspace opacities that can be related to diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. And uh, the chastity pattern is, it is characterized by the ground glass opacities and uh, more or less associated with consultations. So those are the uh, imaging wise, uh, the clues that we can gather uh, in a patient uh, with 
vasculitis, squamous vasculitis, per se. And if I were to describe then the, the clinical utility of alpha positive in patients with vasculitis, uh, all we know that. Uh, there are two major staining patterns in ANCA, the C ANCA and the ANCA, they can be identified. Uh, but having said that, the recognition of the distinct pattern can also, is also not very easy because sometimes uh, it can be confused with other autoantibodies. antibodies. And the indirect immunofluorescent examination uh, would be the method of choice. So again, the main target antigens are protein S3 and monovirucidase. So the, the antibodies to several other antigens can produce the patterns of P and C and C. So those are the uh, those are some points that we have to keep in mind. And as the direct immunofluorescent patterns were defined, it seems that C and C was associated almost also exclusively with vegetables, and P and C with renal limited forms of microscopic polyangiitis. And uh, other important point is, of course, we are uh, talking about the association of ANCAS with vasculitis, but ANCA can occur in a wide range of other clinical conditions, including infections, other connective tissue disorders, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune hepatitis, malignancy, and all of those conditions also, positive ANCA would be there. So this would identify the potentially important causes of false positive ANCAS. Uh, so in management wise, uh, we have to have some idea about the uh, definitions of the disease status of the patients with uh, small vessel vasculitis. They can have active disease. If the patient is having new persistent or worsening clinical signs and symptoms, not related to prior damage, we uh, classify them as having active disease. And active severe, the severe disease, if the patient is having live or threatening manifestations, that patient is having a severe disease. And if uh, non-severe disease, a uh, patient is not having life-threatening or organ-threatening manifestation, but other manifestations such as rhinosinusitis, asthma, or uncomplicated cutaneous disease can happen. And remission is uh, absence of clinical signs or symptoms on and off, on or off immunosuppressive therapy. And we describe refractory disease as a persistent active disease, despite an appropriate course of immunosuppressive therapy. And relapse as recurrence of active disease following a period of remission. So having these uh, definitions of disease status in mind, we can have a brief idea about the management, main ma uh, major steps in the management of these patients. Uh, these are the management steps uh, described in ACR criteria in vaginal granulomatosis as well as microscopic polyangiitis. So in active severe disease, uh, the recommended Remission induction therapy would be rituximab, and they recommend rituximab or the cyclophosphamide along with the uh, glucocorticoids. And with those, if the patient is achieving the remission, uh, we can go into maintenance therapies. So the options would be rituximab, methotrexate, acetylcholine. So with, while on those maintenance therapies, the patient gets a relapse. If it is a severe flare and the patient was on rituximab, we can switch into cyclophosphamide. And the patient is having a severe flare, but it was not rituximab, we can try with rituximab. That is active severe disease. If the patient is having uh, active non-severe disease, then the induction, with, uh, induction of the remission would be with glucocorticoids with uh, methotrexate. If the patient achieves the remission, uh, we can uh, continue the same medications for maintenance of the remission. And if the patient is having a relapse, we can consider switch to a different agent. So briefly, these are some management steps uh, in patients with vaginas as well as microscopic polyangiitis, depending on the disease status, whether this patient is having active severe disease or active non-severe disease. And as for the uh, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, uh, again, if the patient is having active uh, severe disease, we can use IV pulse or high high dose or daily sorry high dose daily oral glucocorticoids with cyclophosphamide or rituximab. If the patient is not having uh, severe disease, if it is a non-severe disease, options would be glucocorticoids with others, mepolizumab, methotrexate, acetylcholine, and so on. So those are the major steps in management of these patients and. Um, 
So if I were to go back to the case, what happened to our patient? So you, we went ahead with did an HRCT and sorry about that, it got rotated actually. It actually showed multiple scattered pulmonary nodules in both lungs. Uh, some are speculated and some nodules show central cavitation. So they have uh, cavitatory lung nodules bilaterally. So the comment was given as lung parenchymal epidermis could be due to bacteria. So uh, then we went ahead and did some other investigations, including hydroptic bronchoscopy, uh, which we found no endobronchial lesions, and bronchial wash was also negative for hemocytrin beta macrophages, which will. If it is positive, it gives some clue about the pulmonary hemorrhages, but it was not there in this patient. And his uh, other autoimmune screening noted that it was 15, and ANA was positive in 1 in 80, nuclear pattern. And the qualitative assessment of PM, CAR, and CR, they both were positive. So, so management wise, he uh, initially gave IV antibiotics with marifin and later changed to oral capitalism. And uh, with the given findings of clinical history, examination findings, and as well as laboratory investigations, including positive ANPA and the imaging uh, results uh, supporting the vaginus granulomatosis, uh, relies with the rheumatology team, and he was diagnosed to have uh, vasculitis and the associated vasculitis, possibly GPA. And he was started on methotrexate and followed prednisone. So, Actually, this patient was on very far away place, so I could not get the repeat imaging uh, for us to compare whether the patient achieved the uh, expected remission. But uh, uh, those were the management steps. So uh, I would like to highlight some points uh, in here uh, because in patients with systemic vasculitis, as pulmonologist, we see patients' lungs, but Vasculitis is indeed a systemic disease. So <laughs> looking through patients' lungs only, uh, we can miss uh, vasculitis. So uh, also, uh, vasculitis is not a straightforward condition that we can diagnose. It has so many variable, very different, very uh, uh, lot of the, uh, clinical manifestations. It has no pathognomonic features either radiologically or uh, investigation wise. So it's always a collective uh, entity where we have to gather all the information and then decide on management and the diagnosis. So I have to, uh, I'd like to point out some uh, important messages that I have to give you. So the ANCA testing. So it should remain as a part of the investigation of patients in whom this small vessel vascular is affected, but it cannot replace careful clinical assessment and appropriate use of other investigations. And the high theta of ANCA, C ANCA actually, detected in a patient with appropriate clinical features uh, is supportive evidence for vaginas and other close related vasculitis, but absence of ANCA also does not exclude the diseases. By contrast, positive ANCA result with out, uh, without other clinical evidence, <laughs> may represent a false positive. So, another important point is with regard to the monitoring of patients with vaginous granulomatosis, uh, and the teachers can be considered as a part of care, careful clinical and laboratory evaluation of the diseases, but it is not suitable as a screening test for vasculitis. <laughs> um, and many of those non vasculitic and associated diseases can be exacerbated by inappropriate immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, so, having said that, all those uh, cogents should be there, but ANCA testing is still uh, has a potential valuable role in this difficult area of diagnosis. So, that we have to keep in mind. And beautiful imaging. The HRCT patterns, as I said earlier, they can be many, and they are various. They are also not pathognomic. So, but having said that, knowledge of the main HRCT findings related to these specific clinical, pathological, and laboratory data, they should be mandatory for the assessment of early and accurate diagnosis of pulmonary vasculitis. So, uh, because of these uh, uh, constraints, however, this, this the diagnosis is often delayed, 
And since the the disease could be had, could have similar clinical and radiological manifestations, so multidisciplinary approach it is strongly recommended in order to combine clinical features, radiological features, and morphological data, and to come to a correct diagnosis and treatment. So, thank you so much uh, for your cooperative listening. Thank you, Questions from the physical audience. Yes. How are you going to get biopsies from this young lady? Yes. So it depends. If uh, if the HRCT findings. We have, we know the HRCT findings. There's a nodules. They can be carried. So, in nodules, we can make biopsies. We can do a, a phobies, I mean, a bronchoscopy. If those, if those lesions are endobronchial, we can take endobronchial biopsies. So, if the lesions are in more peripheries, uh, if it is really needed, if we need uh, biopsy reports, you know, as, as a matter of very important thing, then we can have guided biopsies. So, guided low. So, but uh, actually speaking, it is not uh, done in 100% I mean, in all cases, but if it is really necessary, we can try with those. If it, uh, we can have an idea with this patient is having endobronchial lesions with a CT, then we can do the fibrotic chromoscopy and get the biopsy. And other than that, if it is more valuable, we still need a biopsy. If it is not scary, we can to get the biopsy. Thank you. Any more questions? In absence of any more questions, I would like to thank Tom. Then, and then hand over the uh, certificate of appreciation. Mm -hmm.